Hi, this is the first of two short presentations on understanding uh, indicators and aquatic environment. So it's taking indicator species in the particular context of water and wetlands. So my name is Ian Rotherham, I'm Emeritus Professor at Sheffield Hammond University. Where there's water, there's life. It's the foundation of all living things and where we have water bodies then we expect to get a diversity of species, large, small, visible, invisible, etc, uh, etc. Et some common, some rare. We need to think about the types of water and aquatic or marine conditions. So aquatic environments include fresh water, um, brackish water, salt water or marine. So great diversity and in fact the wetland environments cover the bulk of the planet's surface and in times past far more because we historically we drained and desiccated vast areas of land which were actually wetland. So we need to think about that when we're considering the sort of water and wetlands that we, we have. The interface between water and terrestrial is always very, very interesting and very significant. Understanding how a, a freshwater body works as well in terms of the food chains, the processes of um, photosynthesis from sunlight to detritus on the, the bottom of, say, a pond or a lake or a slow flowing river. And then the food chains of organisms, the phytoplankton, the actual plankton that of photosynthetic plants in the water, the zooplankton, the tiny animals that eat them, and then all the various animals which eat the smaller animals as well. So we start to see how an aquatic ecosystem works. Well, we have various issues with aquatic systems. This is a, an interesting situation, the Shirebrook as it was back in the 1980s. Uh, the historic boundary stream between Yorkshire and Derbyshire. And you can see there that the water is quite clear. It's not particularly murky. There's not much um, suspended solids in it. But look at the green algal growth. There's no higher plants, no water crocus or fungal, but there's a lot of green algae. That suggests high levels of nutrition. The Banks of the stream have got lots of invasive species like Himalayan balsam, and the vegetation that's overhanging the stream is full of all sorts of unsavory detritus. And basically, this is a stream with a huge amount of pollution input. And we can use indicator species to tell us about this, to tell us about the ambient conditions in the stream. And the, one of the interesting things with indicator species is that they don't just give you a, a one off spot check, they give you an evaluation of conditions over time. So a pollution incident or pollution levels in a stream or brook or river may actually affect the ecology over months or years. And a one-off spot check may not detect that pollution incident, but the indicators will tell you this. Some general guidance on pollution assessment, no fauna, core fauna, suggest toxins, metals, pesticides, herbicides, oil, etc. Rich but not diverse form of flora, probably organic pollution like sewage or farm slurry. And these can be very, very damaging because they can remove oxygen from the water body and remove many, many uh, other key species. For fauna, but masses of algae and bacteria, and you've probably got organic or fertilizer pollution. So we can look at broad conditions and come to conclusions about what it is that's affecting our water body. Invertebrates of fresh waters are groups of taxa, especially well-developed as indicators of aquatic water quality. There's been a huge amount of work done on this, and you can find reference, references online, and we've provided some additional notes to go with these lectures. So we can look at different sorts of water bodies. This is a pond that tends to park as a creative pond with flowering rush, yellow fringe, water lily, and various other species within it. Contrasting completely with the River Derwent near Chatsworth in, Dar in Derbyshire, 
this is actually the Paslow end of it. So one, you've got a standing water, the other, you've got a running water. Both are relatively clean, relatively unpolluted. But the fact that one is standing water, one is running water, will have a big impact on the flora and flora. So we can look at the different organisms, and we're doing this in the, the field workshop. These are some of the things that you might find in your water body, and it indicates relatively clean water, things like freshwater limpet in a stream, the uh, eared snail in a pond, and various larvae like freshwater shrimps and caddis flies of different species in both the running water and in your pond if it's fairly clean. There are various groups of freshwater invertebrates which are particularly interesting. And some of these, the experts get down to species, but you can still get information just from identifying them generically, which is quite easy. Again, we will talk about this in more, in more detail. But the mayflies and the stoneflies, the Ephemeroptera and the Plecoptera are good indicators of unpolluted streams and rivers, but also sometimes in uh, ponds and lakes. As nymphs, they need well oxygenated water, but they have a high tolerance range within the taxa. So within the group of these animals, uh, some are very sensitive, some are relatively tolerant. So that means if you can identify the species, you can actually start to get a more sophisticated and more nuanced assessment of pollution levels. It's therefore most informative to record the abundances and ranges of species present at a site. I can say there are more detailed notes provided on aquatic species and water indices. So here are some uh, indicators. These are stoneflies of different species, and they are distinctive by having two tails. And then the different species have different degrees of tolerance. Mayflies have three tails, so again, easy to separate from them. And then there we have freshwater shrimp, gamorous coolates, and various little beetles, which again uh, are a job for the specialists, but at this level you can just identify them as beetles, and they tend to indicate better water quality. There's a mayfly larva with its three tails at the end. And a dragonfly larva. Um, I'm not sure what it is. That may be one of the chasers. It's quite a broad bodied thing. And again, dragonflies and damselflies tend to indicate better quality water because they are at the top of the food chain. So they are dependent on having a functional food chain beneath them on which they predate. And we can identify nymphs, the keys, and easy guides to identify the species. And the advantage of having the nymph over the adult is that having a nymph in your pond or stream confirms that they are breeding there rather than simply visiting the tourists. And then things like the Mobius, the uh, freshwater rams, again, a good indicator of good water quality, or the eared snail. Again, we're looking at diversity. We've got several species, or have we just got one species? And if we've just got the one, is it a pollution sensitive or Tolerant. Things that make differences to water bodies. Here we have a running water body, and you've got some of the features that actually make a difference. We've got a uh, weir, which actually took water off to power a mill further downstream. But what it does is it bubbles the water, it oxygenates the water, it's pouring over the cascade there. So that is good for the health of the water. We've got lots of stones and boulders here, lots of little hideaways for um, invertebrates and fish. So high oxygen levels, and good health, clean water, and lots of substrates in which microorganisms can, uh, and microarthropods and the like can hang away and hide away. You've also, above the weir, got slow water. So you've got what we call riffles, and then we've got deep water pools here. So again, that's, that will make a difference. You get, you're going to get different species above this to the ones you get below. 
Organic pollution is a common source of problems in water bodies. Now, again, it's important to recognize that this can occur artificially from things like farm slurries or from sewage outputs, or it can occur naturally. If you have a stream going through a woodland or if you have a pond near to trees, then you get organic pollution in inverted commas because of leaf fall. And that is a perfectly natural situation, although it may, may be something that you don't wish to encourage because it will decrease the biodiversity of your water body. But some taxa, some groups such as the Hirundinaceae, the leeches, um, are often common in the areas of organic pollution. And they feed on things like polygachy worms, a particular group of worms closely related to earthworms. And these are the tube effect species. So these are able to survive in, in with the organic pollution. They feed on the organic detritus, but they are then in turn eaten by the leeches. So you get a food chain there, but it's very limited. There might be a lot of it, but there's not much diversity. And one of the sources of nutrients coming into water bodies is organic material detritus. And therefore some organisms do well where there's high organic, but not necessarily toxic pollution. You've got nutrients going through the system, and if things can tolerate the low levels of oxygen, then they can do quite well. But what you're getting is a very, very limited food web, a very limited food chain. Again, a close look at the shy brook. Don't look too closely because it's quite unpleasant. This was basically how it was before we intervened back in the 1980s, and it was essentially what they call prude primary. Um, treatment to the sewage, it's basically raw sewage sifted out through a big grate, which just took out some of the, but obviously, as you can see, then not all of the physical material and the rest just poured into the stream. The argument from Yorkshire Water at the time was well, when it hits the rother, the rother's so toxic that it'll kill anything that comes in from the Shire Brook. At this point, our jaws hit the ground, as you can imagine and Yorkshire Water backtracked and eventually spent over a million pounds on a new re system to take the contaminated waste to the Woodhouse Mill sewage treatment course. One way to use this information, uh, and it can be very simple or very complex, is through what we call indices. So observations such as looking at the level of pollution tolerance are most useful if the information is collected in a standardised way um, and a standardized sampling, standardized sampling method and a standardized effort. So you have a particular technique and you apply it for a certain amount of time. So that's the standard way. And you do it at a certain frequency. Then convert it to some sort of pollution or water quality index. So for example, for a pollution discharge into a stream, for example, so a point discharge, not a generic um, discharge of pollution over a wide area, but a point discharge such as a sewage input, the index I could be number of species above the discharge minus the number below the discharge divided by the number of species above the discharge times 100. So you actually get a, an effect um, assessing the number of species that you've lost. And the higher the value of the I, then the worse the pollution. This may be made more sophisticated by scoring species in terms of their reliability as indicators and by grading in terms of the number of individuals in each species or taxon. So you can both count and you can identify. This becomes more time consuming and more knowledge demanding. So obviously to get to species from many of these things. For a lot of them you can get to the broad taxon quite easily. Has it got two tails? Has it got three? Is it a stonefly? Is it a mayfly? Has it got a caddis shell or not? To get beyond that to the actual species can be quite tricky without a bit of practice. It, it is doable, but you need practice. In polluted streams and rivers, the presence of masses of bacterium, the spirotillus known as sewage virus, is a sure indicator of organic pollution. The biological indicator for contamination by human sewage is the bacterium Escherichia. Coli, E. coli, usually observed after culture in an agar gel. So that one, you have to take your sample, you have to get it cultured, and you then need someone who can recognise the E. coli culture. Fairly straightforward to do, 
and it is uh, very specific for human sewage pollution. Some of the changes in flora and fauna following effluent discharges have been very well documented. So it's worth taking time to read up on some of these which are presented in the notes. Try to consider indicators from different taxonomic groups and different pollutants. So you're actually not just relying on one or two things, you're looking at different taxa, different indicators to give you a more robust assessment of what's actually happening. So pollution tolerators are things like rat tail maggots that send up these fantastic telescopic breathing tubes. So they can sit in an organic soup with low oxygen and they just send the tail up to the surface and hang by the meniscus through these little hooks. Um, as do these culex midge larvae um, and these little moth fly larvae. And they can cope with high levels of pollution. So they're telling you that you've got organic pollution in the water, but it's not actually toxic. And this is a classic study in terms of what happens. This is above stream, this is downstream, and the outfall is here. And you've got sewage or some other organic material that comes in and oxygen level starts to plummet. And then it gradually, as soon as it sits downstream, picks up again through things like the riffles uh, and weirs that I've already mentioned. The biological and biochemical oxygen demand, that's the amount of oxygen that will be used up, uh, breaking down through respiration, the organic pollution in the water at a particular time. So just by the outfall, it's at its peak, the organic material has been broken down, oxygen is being used up, so oxygen is kept in there. And then the BOD, as it's called, a crude estimate of organic pollution, biological, biochemical oxygen demand drops as you go downstream. Salt also drops, suspended solids, the, the gunk that comes in is broken down and dissolved or deposited, suspended solids. Ammonium increases with the immediate aftermath of the organic material being broken down. And then ammonium is broken down into nitrate, which is more soluble, and that then uh, drops as you go downstream. And the other nutrient, the high macronutrient, is phosphate. So, phosphorus. so these are the sort of changes that you get. And then here um, in this area below the outfall, sewage fungus, then I've already mentioned. And then uh, arise in protozoans, little microbes, and then algae picking up. As the sewage fungus decreases, the algae starts to kick in with the nitrates and the nutrients, etc and various other species that follow in protozoa, bacteria, et cetera, et cetera. This distance may be uh, a few meters, or it may be hundreds of meters, depending on the scale of the sewage input. The ammonium discharge from Black Meadow sewage works in the 1980s was detectable in the mouth of the River Humber. So that gives you an idea of how catastrophic this can be. You also then get a a series of changes in the pollution tolerant fauna, the tubificity, the chironomids, etc., cellus, uh, the freshwater hoglouse, and then gradually the clean water fauna picks up. This may be a, a distance downstream, it may be quite close to the discharge if you've got high water flow and not much sewage. It all depends on balance. And of course, what you may get is a series of point discharges, one after the other downstream, or you may get landscape scale pollution, such as from farming, simply washing off the whole area. And that then has a, a negative impact like this on the whole of the, that particular watercourse. So this was a Shirebrook in the 1980s, it's pretty grim. It's also just gone under a, a deep landfill, so the water coming out stinks, it's anaerobic, and it's got all sorts of stuff that have gone into it as it's gone under water, underground and um, away from oxygen. So that's in a pretty poor condition. It's also been canalized, so the river has been straightened and some bits have been culverted. So that is pretty, pretty unpleasant. The other thing that happens here is it's been disconnected from its floodplain. It's got big banks along either side as an engineering solution to stop um, small scale flooding. What it means is that the river no longer functions 
as a living watercourse within its floodplain. Now that in the long term is a disaster. So an appropriately trained ecologist visiting a site can quickly tell if it's polluted, plus with the nature of pollution and whether the problem is a regular steady input of a periodic or episodic one, or perhaps a one-off one from which the site is recovering. So all these have different markers and they have different impacts and different implications. Importantly, indicators such as these can give an overall integrated evaluation of environmental quality experienced over a period of time. In this way, they differ significantly from physical or chemical measures of environmental quality at a fixed point in time and space. The sort of microorganisms that we pick up particularly in the aftermath of the pollution, there's lots of little protozoans, uh, unicellular algae, um, and amoeba, and all sorts of things in this, this soup. The water is essentially a, a nutrient-rich soup. If you've got too much in the way of nutrients, you get masses of a few species. As you drop nutrient levels, then you get fewer uh, biomass, but greater diversity. And if you reduce the nutrients significantly, then you actually lose a lot of the biodiversity anyway, and you end up with a few small numbers, small, small biomass of a relatively few, maybe in some cases quite rare species. The pondweeds are good indicators, and the water crowfoot can be quite complicated for various forms, some of which uh, thrive in standing water, as we've got here, some of which are in flowing rivers, the river water crowfoot which is now abundant, where it was Don and Sheaf and a place like that was being reintroduced. So again, we can look at these plants and these tell us about water quality, but they also provide habitat for a lot of the other species. So looking at this, this is going to be a good size, clean water, plenty of uh, water crowfoot and other pondweeds, and this will be good habitat for uh, dragonflies, damaged plants, etc. Some of these indicators can also be used for slow flowing or standing waters. Remember that some species will be absent, not due to pollution, but simply because the environment of the site is unsuitable. So the presence of open art, dragonflies and damselflies may give useful indications of site quality. And also importantly, in some cases, and this is where the interpretation comes in, they're highly mobile. So if your site becomes of good quality, then these are species that would be expected to arrive and will get in and will establish. If you have species which have poor dispersal, then if they are recovering any site that's damaged, they may simply not be there because they've not had a chance to get back in. Partially polluted or eutrophic ponds and canals will support some of the common damselflies and, dam and dragonflies, um, which are now increasingly common across the region. So, they don't indicate necessarily totally unpolluted sites, but they um, represent a species of reasonably good and maybe recovering sites. Cleaners, cleaner waters will support a greater diversity. So those with pollution food and enrichment by runoff from fertilizers, such as agriculture, or by insecticides and herbicides will have few of any age of water. So the drug flies and damsels are quite sensitive. They can get back in if you drop the pollution, but particularly certain sensitive pollutions, such as insecticides and herbicides, can remove all of them. But a recovering site will have a few species, a clean water site will have far more. That's the end of part one. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>